Hello everyone. Today I'll spend quite a bit of time describing the complex anatomic relationships of the maxillary nerve. Studying the complex anatomy helps analyze the pathologic manifestation of this nerve. Now again, you've seen this uh, picture before. Last week, I talked about the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, and today I'll be talking about the maxillary or the second division of the, mac of the trigeminal nerve. Now last week I showed these two slides when I talked about the orbital apex and today I'm adding another structure and that is the foramen rotundum which some, uh, some people consider as part of the orbital apex and additionally the other nerve we're now adding to the list of the orbital apex is the maxillary nerve. So here we have the foramen rotundum below the lower than the optic canal, the superior oval fissure. Remember, we talked about the clinoid foramen rotundum is over here. Now, we can identify the foramen rotundum, uh, which we can see on the specimen here. Again, clinoid, superior oval fissure, foramen rotundum. And we can see it the best on the coronal CT image. Here's the foramen rotundum on each side. It's still hard to find its location on the sagittal and the axial images, but here it is on the, on the axial image, and here it is on the reformatted sagittal, foramen rotundum, where the second uh, division of the trigeminal goes through. Again, on the coronal MR, we can see the foramen rotundum with the V2 uh, the maxillary nerve sitting within, this is post-contrast, normally you will see the rich vascular plexus around the nerve. And adjacent to it, we also can see the vidian nerve and in the vidian canal, which I'll discuss later. So again, foramen rotundum and vidian canal, as we can see on the specimens here. Although it's easier to see the foramen rotundum on the CT, on MR, it's much more difficult, but we can see it again in this location. What structure am I outlining in this lateral view of the skull? Very good. Asif already answered. Uh, the ter the ter maxillary fissure of the the pterygopalatine fossa, a very tiny structure, however incredibly important in uh, perineal spread of tumors. You'll see later. One of the problem is that in most images of the skull, the mandible. Uh, hides the pterygopalatine fossa. But when you remove the mandible, it's more obvious. Now, the pterygopalatine fossa is a major pathway for spread of tumor and infection between the orbit, the nasal and oral cavity, the masticator space, and the middle cranial fossa. So let's talk a little bit about the boundaries. Laterally, we have the pterygomaxillary fissure, and then uh, anteriorly we have the maxilla. Posteriorly, it's, it is the pterygoid process of the sphenoid, and then in blue here, we can also see the palatine bone uh, in forming the inferior aspect of the pterygopalatine fossa. And way deep, we have the pterygoid Pterygum, uh, the sphenopalatin foramen. Now, can we identify some of these structures on CT and MR? Here we can. If we look at the axial CT, this is the pterygomaxillary fissure, the outer boundary of the 
tergopalatine fossa, and immediately we see the sphenopalatine foramen leading into the nasal cavity. And this is the tergopalatine fossa between the white arrows. We can identify it with more difficulty on the coronal plane. Here, it is, here is the tergopalatine fossa. Lateral on the sagittal leaf format image, we can see uh, that we can see it right here behind the maxillary sinus. Now, one way to try to find it in the coronal plane, which is important, as you'll see later on, is here's the here's the foramen rotundum. As you go uh, anteriorly in the slices, you will come to the tergopalatine fossa and then in front of it, you'll then enter into the orbit. It's a little harder to see the tergopalatine fossa on the axial MR, the boundaries that is. You can see the fat behind the maxillary sinus. Here it is in the coronal MR. Again, the, la the boundaries are a little hard to make out. Easier to see on a sagittal MR image. Now, the reason the tergopalatine fossa is so important is because of all these foramina and fissures that open in, into it. And we will go through all of these. So again, the tergomaxillary fissure, the sphenopalatine foramen, foramen rotundum, the pterygoid or vidian canal, the greater and lesser palatine canals for Emma, superior orbital fissure, and inferior orbital fissure. So again, let's go through these one by one. So again, this is the, the outer one is a pterygo maxillary fissure, which I already outlined before, and at medially is a sphenopalatine foramen, which we can see outlined here on the CT. Then we have the foramen rotundum where the V2 comes through. We can see it here on the bone. Here it is, foramen rotundum entering the tergopalatine fossa. And then the other structure, which is very hard to identify, is the pterygoid or the vidian canal, which is a very tiny structure. And we can see it here entering the top of the pterygopalatine fossa. Here, here's where the entry is, again, we see the tergopalatine fossa. Then we, then we have the greater and lesser palatine canals and foramina, which we can see down here on the sagittal view. And here it is on an axial anatomic drawing, the greater and the lesser foramina. We can also see them very nicely on the axial CT. Here they are. We can see here on a sagittal uh, reformatted image, the greater and lesser canal. And here, an image from the literature showing it in the coronal plane, because I forgot to find one. And beautifully here, on a sagittal MRs, in this paper from Italy showing the, the palatine nerves within the, within the canals, and here even the fibers going to towards the soft palate. Okay, the superior orbital fissure, which I talked about last time, is easily identified here. Here it is on that coronal CT. Now the inferior orbital fissure is a very difficult structure to visualize because it's, it's small and not easily seen. So again, if we look at the specimen, optic canal, superior orbital fissure, which connects with the inferior orbital fissure at the lateral aspect of the floor of the orbit. And basically, you don't really see it by itself, but you see parts of it. So here it is on the coronal CT, on the axial CT, it's this little gap we see here, and here it is on the sagittal CT at the lateral margins. Now, I just, this is a, a beautiful picture out of Asset's uh, atlas, 
looking at the floor of the orbit from below. We're looking like, you know, just above the teeth, as if you angled the, the skull, and you're looking at the inferior orbital fissure. Here's the zygomatic arch. And notice how it connects with the pterygopalatine fossa. So all this is a, a major connection with all these various foramina fissures with the pterygopalatine fossa. Now, what about the nerves that sit in the pterygopalatine fossa? First, we have the uh, maxillary nerve. As soon as it goes through the foramor tendon, it sits at the top of the pterygopalatine fossa and gives off a number of branches. It gives off the small pterygopalatine nerves, very critical, as you'll see later. Here we have the ganglion. This little structure is the pterygoid of the video nerve. Then we have some branches. The, gray, uh, the greater and lesser palatine nerves going inferiorly. Then there's a, the post posterior superior alveolar nerve giving some branches to the teeth. And the zygomatic nerve going laterally. But the main continuation of the maxillary nerve is the infraorbital nerve, which enters a canal here. Now, why is the pterygopalatine ganglia so important? You, it gets sensory fibers from the maxillary nerve. It gets parasympathetic fibers from the vidian, which is really a continuation of the greater superficial petrosal nerve that I'll be talking about when I talk about the facial nerve. Then it gets sympathetic uh, fibers from the carotid artery. And from there, from the ganglion, Fibers go to the lacrimal gland, the glands of the nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, palate, and the roof of the oral cavity. And just to show that we can see a lot, this is a beautiful image again by Dr. Kasselman from Belgium showing that on the coronal image, here's the pterygopalatine fossa. We can see the ganglion. We can see the pterygopalatine branch here, just like we see on this anatomic diagram, and uh, a, a pretty amazing image. Now, why is this important to identify the pterygopalatine fossa? There's a condition called cluster headache, which is a group grouping of headache attacks occurring together. And the individual ex typically experience repeated attacks of excruciatingly severe unilateral headache pain. And one of the treatment that has been used for it is gamma knife treatment. But how do you identify the region of the ganglion? Is by following the pterygoid or the vidian nerve anteriorly. I just want to show this beautiful anatomic dissection from the 1930s by in Bassett Atlas doing a, a, a kind of a sagittal dissection of the orbit and, and the floor of the orbit. Here we see the maxillary nerve. And here's the pterygoid, or the vidian nerve, and this is the ganglion. Uh, you can see the close proximity of the maxillary nerve to the pterygopalatine ganglion, but you can follow also. So if you follow the, the video nerve anteriorly, you will then uh, see where it joins the ganglion. So if we now look at coronal images of the pterygoid or the video canal, here it is. We go anteriorly where it start, starts to widen as it enters the pterygopalatine fossa, a little wider here, and here it is within the pterygopalatine fossa joining it over here. We can also see it on an axial uh, CT. Here's the Vidian canal and pterygopalatine fossa, sagittal view where it joins the pterygopalatine fossa. But most people, when they try to do the gamma knife, will follow it and it post to enter a direction on the CT. Now, if it's fairly easy to see on CT, 
it's it's difficult to see exactly on the coronal MR. Here again is the Vidian Canal with a nerve in it. It, it looks like it's here, but is this the ganglion? It's hard to tell unless you have this beautiful image uh, done by Dr. Castleman. On the sagittal plane, uh, on sagittal MR, it's fairly easy to identify the pterygo palatine fossa because it's full of fat behind the air and the maxillary sinus, so we can see it nicely here in these normal structure. One of the problems is identifying what is within the pterygo palatine fossa because as you can see here, there's a bunch of arteries that run through it, the artery of the pterygoid canal, the pharyngeal artery, the sphenopalatine artery, and so we see a lot of vessels here in addition to the nerves. So it's hard so far to, on the regular MR to separate. The, this looks like vasculars, but which nerves are we dealing with is hard to tell. Okay, now once, once the maxillary nerve leaves the tergo palatine fossa and continues anteriorly, it enters a canal called the infraorbital canal in the floor of the orbit and in the roof of the maxillary sinus. And we can see here on an anatomic specimen the groove formed by the nerve for the canal. And we can identify this nicely on thin sagittal uh, CT. So here we see the opening where the nerve enters the canal from the pterygopalatine fossa, and here we see the opening at right over here of the infraorbital foramen. And here we can see the outline of the canal in the floor of the orbit. We can even see part of it here on this sagittal MR. Here's a nerve sitting within the canal heading towards the infraorbital foramen. Now, we, here's the is an anatomic specimen, uh, picture showing this is part of the course of the infraorbital canal, and here it goes towards the infraorbital uh, foramen. And we can kind of follow it on these thin coronal uh, CTs. Here it is, and it will go laterally as you go more anteriorly. Here it is, and then eventually leading towards. So just see it in segments. Can identify it also on the axial plane. Here's, here it is, uh, uh, exiting at the infraorbital foramen, starting from the top. Here is where it ends begins and then goes progressively, but you can follow it. Now interestingly, sometimes there's a variation where the infraorbital uh, canal sits within the sinus. <laughs> and interestingly, there was a paper just in the last issue of uh, AJNR, just in November, just came out the 17th, where there's a whole paper about these variations. They looked at 500 cases, and they found about 10% of CTs had this anomaly where the infraorbital canal sits within, within the sinus, either on one side or bilaterally, very similar to my case here. The importance of this is to alert the surgeons who are going to do a fess or surgery within the maxillary sinus that the canal is sitting within the sinus so uh, to avoid damaging the infraorbital nerve. Another th very important thing to look at, not just at the infraorbital foramen, is the, what's called the juxtaforaminal fat pads because these will disappear when there's a tumor involving the various nerves and also you can see here the fat planes in the face, which are very important indicators as well. So it's al always good to check to see that the fat pads and the various locations where the for various foraminas are, are are there and not replaced by soft tissue. Now, again, 
I want to point out, as you'll see pathologically why it's so important, the close proximity of the maxillary nerve and the pterygopalatine fossa with the pterygopalatine ganglion. Notice on the specimen, the ganglion, right next to it, there's a maxillary nerve as demonstrated in, in this uh, picture from Netter. Okay, this is the end of anatomy, not some pathology. What side is abnormality? As Gino and Dan said, the right side, correct. And what, what do we see? And Anshu also. Correct, as Dan said, loss of fat. Not only is there loss of fat, but there's enlargement of the foramen rotundum and also the spheroval fissures full of tissue here. And this was a plexiform neurofibroma, typically enlarging the foramen rotundum. This is a normal for comparison. And here it is on the axial view. Again, remember, this is the foramen rotundum uh, and this in the normal. And you can see this whole area is, is full and extends towards the orbital apex. And here we have a case, again, this was supposedly presumed viral neuritis of V2 causing expansion of the foramen rotundum. We can see also the abnormal signal in the cavernous sinus uh, in, in the region of the foramen rotundum. Here are two cases, two separate cases of meningioma. I think this one was given to me to Amit. We can see here meningioma of the cavernous sinus, in, which also invaded and enlarged the foramen rotundum. On this side, meningioma within the cavernous sinus, extending to the orbital apex and enlarging the foramen rotundum when compared to the other normal side. This was a patient presented with numbness and pain in the face. We see this large cavernous sinus meningioma, but notice that in some areas it, it, it invades and kind of adjacent and uh, destroyed the foramen or tandem, or at least encases it. I think likely explaining the patient's limited numbness in the face because VT was involved, although I'm sure the entire cavernous sinus was full, but at least there's isolated involvement here of the foramen rotundum. What's the con possible, con another condition here involving the foramen rotundum? Which we mentioned many times before. Schwannoma, it's not a pa bad possibility. Any other inflammatory disease, which I always like, lymphoma was mentioned, correct. Anshu mentioned, correct. Lyme, uh, of, you know, all the other conditions we go through are correct. This is a case of Lyme. Uh, notice that it kind of involves, you know, V2, but all the way back to the cavernous sinus region. Here was a normal case that uh, Ash gave me, and you can see this is on a flare image on the 3T. You can actually follow the the entire second division here, and some people have described that the the maxillary nerve, where the second division kind of starts from Meckel's cave and is kind of separate by itself all the way into the flow of the orbit. 
And we, maybe that's the case in this, but we can outline the entire nerve here on this axial and uh, MR. And notice it's very similar to what we see on this involvement with the Lyme, this kind of course of V2. This would be the region of the foramen rotundum. And here's another case of Lyme involving the trigeminal nerve and kind of expanding the foramen rotundum. This was metastatic lesion from a lung tumor, and we can see the involvement of the foramen rotundum involving the cavernous sinus and also the loss loss of the normal appearance of the fat within the orbital apex superior orbital fissure uh, by this metastatic lesion. A melanoma involving the cavernous sinus and the foramen rotundum when we compare it to normal side. This was lymphoblastic leukemia, again, involving the foramen rotundum. Patient presents with facial numbness following trauma. What side is the pathology on and what is it? Correct. As Anshu and Dan said, there's a fracture. Here's a fracture. Now, what is involved here? If we look at this uh, diagram here, again, as we pointed out, this is the foramen or tandem. We, and foramen, the maxillary nerve from the foramen or tandem enters the superior part of the pterygopalatine fossa, yeah, right in this location. So here we have this fracture in the superior part of the, in, involving the ball, wall of the pterygopalatine fossa in, this, in the superior part of the pterygopalatine fossa. So here, we, if we look at this coronal CT, the foramen rotundum looks okay, but just in front of it, we see the fracture line. So this is the pterygopalatine fossa. Remember, th this is right the area here. This is the top of the region, the top of the pterygopalatine fossa where the nerve is running before it enters the inferior orbital fissure. So this is where the fracture is, and that's why this patient has facial numbness. I forgot to mention that as the uh, maxillary nerve uh, exits, the foramen rotundum and enters the pterygopalatine fossa as it continues arterially, it goes to the inferior orbital fissure towards the infraorbital canal. What's wrong here? What is missing? As I've already mentioned, that the, the pterygopalatine fossa, and as Ben said, the fat. Remember, there's a huge amount of fat here. Remember, I showed the vessels and the nerves. Should never see tissue and no fat behind the sinus. And again, here's the normal. We should see all this fat here. You can see here the specimen showing the amount of fat. So that's all gone. Adenocystic carcinomas are notoriously involving the pterygopalatine fossa because it travels all along the nerves. Anytime you get a diagnosis of adenocystic carcinoma, look for perineural spread. And here's the same specimen showing, again, here's the fat on the normal side and the pterygopalatine fossa behind the sinus. This is all full here of tumor tissue. Notice pterygopalatine fossa is widened, full of tissue, uh, 
compared to the opposite side. And here it is again on the coronal, invading the spheroval fissure, the orbital apex, and here again the pterygopalatine fossa and the coronal view. This was a patient with a nasopharyngeal squamous. They had V2 and V3 ten symptoms. We can understand the V2 abnormalities because of the involvement of the pterygopalatine fossa. Again, notice loss of fat here compared to the normal. The tumor also extended posteriorly to the region of the Meckel's cave where the third nerve would be coming out and explains why we have both V2 and V3 symptoms. What do we see here and what is the possible lesion? Correct. As Gino and Anshu say, a mass in an enlarged uh, pterygopalatine fossa. What can this mass be? Which said schwannoma, geno, asif. Why is it why is it more likely to be a schwannoma? Correct. As Rich said, and Anshu said, the bony e expansion. L notice that this does not destroy the bone. It kind of bowed the posterior wall, the maxillary sinus. And we can see it on the, on the bone windows here. So this is more likely to be a benign uh, tumor. And this was, again, a plexiform neurofibroma. So it's important to look at the bone outline here. And here's a biopsy proven schwannoma and an asymptomatic woman. And look, look at the size of it, uh, really expanding. It doesn't look so benign here, but this was biopsy proven. And again, deforming uh, the back of the maxillary sinus. Okay, what about this case? Another lesion? What other lesion can commonly occur here? Not commonly, but occur in this location? Correct. Asif mentioned the lesion. This was a young male. What do we see? We see a huge destructive mass. This was a 16-year-old man, a boy. Notice the massive lesion, destruction of part of the clivus, the sphenoid body below the cella. This was a juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, or JNF. The exact etiology where they start is a little controversial. People say they start in the region of the sphenopalatine foramen. Some people say it starts in the, in the pterygoid canal, but classically they will cause expansion and destruction of the pterygopalatine fossa. Okay, what is the abnormality here? Ben has the answer, the right infraorbital canal. What has happened to it? It's not expanded. It's fractured. 
This patient was three years post-trauma, had V2 symptoms due to entrapment of the infraoral nerve. And we can see the fracture here. This is a chronic fracture. And again, if we look at this picture, this would be the location. And we see all these fibers of the, the, the maxillary division supplying the nose and the upper fa face. So this was a chronic fracture compared to the normal side. And here was another case that came in trauma. Patient had infraorbital numbness and notice the fracture in the region of the infraorbital foramen that we see normally here. Here it's all fractured. This is a beautiful view. This is the which uh, I found in the thin T, uh, sagittal T2s. So here's the normal infraorbital canal as it leads towards the infraorbital foramen. And notice the fracture line here and how this is kind of pushed out of the way a little bit, the two walls. So this is why the patient had the numbness involving the infraorbital canal. So again, on the coronal, here's a, here's a fracture. This is the normal infraorbital canal here. And again, we can see the nerve on this coronal specimen sitting in the floor of the orbit. And here's as it exits. Normally, we can see the infraorbital nerve on normal coronal imaging. So here, for instance, as we look here, as we can see it here, we can see it here as it gets closer to the foramen, and here it is. No, this is already within the foramen. You can see that the infraorbital canal and the foramen is not at the rim of the orbit. This is a little bit below. So that's why it, you kind of coming out of this sinus here, or, and here's where the infraorbital foramen would be. Notice in this picture here that sometimes the canal is not complete, and maybe just a groove see, sitting below. Here's the nerve sitting below the periosteum of the orbit. So it's not always a completely ossified canal. It may just be a groove. What side is abnormality and what's involved? Correct, as Ben and Asif said, left is the correct side. What is involved? Correct. And Rich, Asif, everybody picked, of course, the right side. Here's the lesion. First view. Enhancement. Large infraorbital canal enhancement. And this is where we get into the important topic of perineural spread. One year follow up, following removal of a left upper lip melanoma. So again, if we look at the ana anatomy here, here are the branches of the maxillary nerve supplying the nose and the upper lip. So if the tumor was here, it traveled along these nerve into the intra uh, orbital foramen. So we know this is already spreading in, uh, over here. And that's why uh, this patient had this lesion. Here's a malignant schwannoma from the literature traveling all the way back to the uh, to the uh, to fifth nerve, the cisternal portion as it comes out of the pond. Again, notice the similarity of this involvement of the entire maxillary nerve to this normal that I showed before, uh, outline the, the entire V2 all the way from the back of the orbit, or from the orbit. What does this case show? Correct. 
Asif mentions thickened and rich, thickened the infraoral nerve. This look at this here, very abnormal. L look at it on the coronal plane, enlarged infraorbital canal. And look what has happened. This is perineural spread at its worst. Start, this patient had a melanoma of the left cheek. This is why it's important to know the course of the nerve. We, over the years, we've had a number of cases where uh, these lesions extended and uh, the diagnosis was not made because the nerve was not appreciated, the full course of the nerve and this is very important to try to catch early. But here we can see the entire nerve is thickened, enlarged canal here. We have enhancement. We have an enhancement in the foramen rotundum here. So this is, this is already spread all the way from the face, the cheek, all the way to the level of the foramen rotundum. Here's a patient who had a left squamous carcinoma. Here's the tumor traveling here along the floor of the orbit. Involves the foramen or tandem. Here we can see involvement of the infraorbital uh, nerve. And notice again the expansion and enhancement of the infraorbital nerve and the floor of the orbit or the roof of the sinus, and this has gone all the way into the cavernous sinus. Another case, only on CT. Facial squamous. Notice we've lost the fat in the region of the infraorbital foramen, soft tissue within it. Here's the canal, full of tumor. Here it is on the coronal. Tumor, tumor in the canal, extending an anteriorly, and we can also see it sagittally, but, but more importantly, it's now in the pterygopalatine fossa behind the uh, maxillary sinus. Where's the abnormality here? Which side? As Ben said, and Anshu, correct, the right side. Notice the size of the infraorbital nerve here. And notice again, marked enlargement of the infraorbital nerve in the floor of the orbit. Here it is, post contrast enhancement. Again, this is the this is the nerve enhancing. Again, I'm showing the comparison of what the normal should look like. This was a malignant, unusual tumor. It's called MPNST, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, also known as a neurofibrosarcoma of the nasolabial area. And this was a non-NF1 patient. And the important thing again here, look at the massive tumor and notice the involvement. We can see on the axial plane the enlarged infraorbital canal. And here it is on the bone windows. Here's a patient had a nasal ala melanoma in 2008. 2010 had a neck mass. 2013 in December had scalp pain and periorbital per pruritus. And unfortunately, we can see again here, here's a lesion. That's where their original tumor was in the nasal ala region enlargement, enhancement in the region of the infraorbital foramen, 
infraorbital canal has tumor. The tumor is now in the pterygopalatine fossa be behind the sinus, involves the cavernous sinus, Meckel's cave, and extended to involve the cisternal portion of the trigeminal nerve. Same in the coronal. Here it is, here it is, here it is. Every view of the infraorbital canal. Here is a foramen rotundum, cavernous sinus, Meckel's cave, cisternal portion of the trigeminal. And here it is on the sagittal view. Bad, bad perineal spread. This is a sinus carcinoma. Again, spreading, involving the cavernous sinus. And again, we can see the full course here on the axial views, all the way to the cisternal portion of the trigeminal. I don't want to belabor this, but you can see all the cases we've had that, so it's, it's not an unusual issue in these facial lesions. And that's why you'll get cases from the dermatologist asking to look for perineural spread. This is a nasolabial uh, case that actually Stefan uh, brought to my attention. And you can see again the enhancement around the infraorbital nerve. And here's a tumor in, in the face expanding the infraorbital canal and extending anteriorly. I mean, posteriorly into the cavernous sinus. Okay, Wh where's the abnormality here? What is involved? As Ben says, the right, anterior right. What's involved? Correct. As Gino said, the palate and the palatine canals. Here's the normal palatine canals destroyed area here. This was a squamous of the palate with V2 symptoms. Notice the normal fat here. Fat is gone. And we're now going to this location of the palatine nerve. Again, beautifully demonstrated on this sagittal high resolution MR. So this is the key, the soft palate with the branches of the palatine nerve supplying the soft palate and then going back into the pterygopalatine fossa. Here's a case we had. Patient presented with maxillary nerve symptoms. Abnormality is on the right side. Look at the size of the palatine canal compared to the normal. Destruction of the bony palate. like some enlargement of the palatine canals. But why did this patient have maxillary nerve symptoms? This is the point I've been stressing all along, the proximity of the pterygopalatine ganglion to V2, the maxillary nerve. It's because of that that as the tumor has traveled up along the palatine nerve in it to involve the pterygopalatine ganglion, it then very easy for it to jump up the nerves to involve the maxillary nerve. And that's why the patient present with maxillary nerve symptoms. This shows you if you're not aware of the anatomy. This patient came initially with had 10 month history of left cheek numbness. The oral cavity was negative, he had sinus surgery, you know, symptoms increased post op. What was missed? Patient had destruction of the palate. We can see the loss of the normal bone. And there was some erosion here of the palatine foramina. And by the, by the time the patient came back, there was already, here's the lesion in the pterygopalatine fossa. And we can see now, it's now unfortunately extended to involve the cavernous sinus. Here it is in the in infraorbital foramen and also
the frame and return them. And this is the last case I'm showing today, which you've seen before. Remember I showed this when I was talking about the cavernous sinus, when I had to read this follow-up meningioma, and I pointed out this was not a meningioma because the artery was pushed uh, laterally, and, and turned out that this patient had an adenocystic carcinoma of the parotid five years before this follow-up study. As you can see, the parotid is go is, was removed uh, on the first slice. We don't see it on this same study. This was four years later. There's nine years after the, the initial study of where the parotid was removed. Anybody see any abnormalities? Okay. This was where there's no, no tumor. Same study, no tumor was seen here. So this is nine years. Two years later, uh, nobody can miss, miss this lesion. And here, going back to the study from two years before, you know, here, here I've blown up the image, so it's easy to see. But, you know, you look at thousands of images on a long weekend, that wasn't exactly an area that would have caught people's attention. But what we have here is this lesion, which has gotten much large. Now, this is the patient with the adenocystic. And as you know, adenocystic love to travel along nerves. So how did it get all the way from the parotid to the nasal septum? Remember the, this famous picture I've shown? So we already knew that the lesion was in the cavernous sinus. So it then proceeded from the cavernous sinus along the maxillary nerve towards the pterygopalatine fossa. Once it's in here, it involves the pterygopalatine ganglion. And there's some branches, important branches here. This, this branch over here supplying the nasal septum is a nasopalatine nerve that passes to the septum. So here's this lesion involving the nasal septum, and here's the key nerve, a branch of the maxillary, but at it, I'm sorry, it, this is already way beyond in the pterygopalatine fossa, and this is the nasopalatine nerve, which supplies the nasal septum and came from the pterygopalatine fossa. So we can see how this tumor started in a parotid, went up uh, along V3, which I'll talk about next week, went into the cavernous sinus, involved the maxillary nerve, went to the pterygopalatine fossa, to the pterygopalatine ganglion, and then for these branches off the pterygopalatine fossa to involve the nasal uh, septum. And this is the last case I will be showing today. Thank you for your attention. Next week, we'll continue with the uh, mandibular nerve.